Ashley Ra Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 11. Pretty Saturday mornings in the spring were not meant to be spent indoors or or on crowded streets. To Ethan, they were meant to be spent on the water. The idea of shopping, actually shopping, was very close to terrifying. <laughs> Don't see why we all have to do this. <laughs> Cousin got to the jeep first, camera in front, turned his head to spare Ethan a glance. Brother, we're all in this. The old Claymore barns for rent, right? We need a place if we're going to build boats. We have to make the deal. Insanity was all Philip had to say. He turned down Market Street in St. Chris. <laughs> Can't go into business if you don't have a place of business. Can't return. Found that single fact and arguable logic. So we take a look at it, make the deal with Claymore, Claremont, and get started. Licenses, taxes, materials, orders, for God's sake, building tools, advertising, phone lines, fax lines, bookkeeping. So take care of it. <laughs> Camp shot carefully. As soon as we sign the lease and get the kid his shoes, you can do whatever comes next. I can do it, Philip claimed. Complained at the same time Seth muttered he didn't need any damn shoes. I even got our first order. I found out about the building. You take care of the paperwork, and you're getting the damn shoes, he told Seth. I don't know how come you're the boss of everybody. Camp could only manage a short grim laugh. Me either. They claim Mott Building wasn't really a barn, but it was the biggest one. In the mid-1700s, it had been a tobacco warehouse. After the Revolution War, the British ships no longer sailed to St. Chris, carrying their wide variety of goods. Businesses that had boomed went bankrupt. The revival in the late 1800s grew directly from the bay. With improved methods of canning and packing, the national market for oysters opened up, and St. Chris once again prospered. And the only, and the old tobacco warehouse was refitted as a packaging house. Then the oyster beds played out, and the building became a glorified storage shelf. Over the last 50 years, it had been empty as often as it was filled. From the outside, it was unprotected. Pretentious twists, sun and weathered faded brick, thumb-sized holes in the mortar, a sagging old roof that was desperately in need of re-shingled. What windows it could bo could boast were small and stingy. Most were broken. All were filthy. Oh yeah, this looks promising. Already disgusted, Phil parked in the pitted lot, the side of the building. We need space. Camera reminder: doesn't have to be pretty. Good thing, because this doesn't come close to pretty. Bit more interesting now. Ethan climbed out. He walked up to the close, closest window, used the banana, bandana from his back pocket to rub off most of the grime so he could pierce her. It's a good space. Got cargo doors at the back. A dock. Needs a little work. A little. Philip stared in over Ethan's shoulder. Floor's rotten out. It's got to be infested with vermin. Probably termites and rodents. <laughs> probably do a good... Probably be a good idea to mention that to Claymont. Ethan decided to keep the rent down. Hearing the tinkle of glass breaking, he saw that Cam and just put his elbow through an already cracked window. Guess we're going inside. Breaking. Breaking and entering. Phil Polishuk said, that's a good start. Cam flipped the pathetic lock on the window and shoved it up. It was already broken. Give me a minute. He boosted himself inside, disappeared. Cool. Set the side of the week. Before a word could be spoken, he climbed inside too. Nice example. A nice example we're setting for him. Philip ran a hand over his face and wished feverly he'd never given up smoking. Well, think of it this way. You can have picked the locks, but he didn't. Right. Listen, Ethan, we've got to think about this. There's no reason why you can't, we can't, build that first boat at your place. Once we start renting buildings, filing for tax numbers, we're committed. What's the worst that could happen? We waste some time and some money. I figure I've got enough of both. You hear the mix of cams and Seth's laughter echoed inside. And maybe we'll have some fun while we're at it. He started running. He started around his front door. Knowing Philip would grumble, but fall. I saw rats. I said in pure delight. When Cam shoved, up, shoved the front door open. It was awesome. Rats. Philip studied the dim space grimly for some time. Lovely. We'll have to get us some couple of she-cats, Ethan decided. They're meaner than Tom's. He looked up, scanning the high ceiling. Water damage showed clearly in the open rafters. There was a loft, but the steps leading up to it were broken, rot, and very likely rats had eaten the scarred wood floor. It would require a great deal of cleaning out and repair, but the space was generous. 
Generous, he began to allow himself to dream. The smell of wood under the saw, the tang of to tongue oil, the slap of hammer on nail, the glint of brass, the squeaking of rigging. He had already seen the way the sun would slant in through new, clean windows onto the skeleton of a slope. Throw up some walls, I guess, for an office, Cam was saying. That dashed here and there, exploring and explaining, and exploring and exclaiming. We'll have to draw up plans or something. This place is a heap. Philip pointed out. Yeah, so it'll come cheap. We put a couple thousand into fixing it up. Better to have it bulldozed than start over. Phil, try to come, try to control that wild optimism. Cam turned to you. What do you think? It'll do. It'll do what? Philip threw what was in. Fall down around her ears. The moment a spider, which Philip estimated to be about the size of a chihuahua, crawled over the toe of his shoe. <laughs> give, give me a gun, he muttered. Came while he laughed, slapped him on the back. Let's go see Claymont. Stuart Claremont was a little man with hard eyes and a dissatisfying mouth. The little chunks of St. Christopher that he owned were most often left to fall into disrepair. If his tenants complained loudly enough, he occasionally and grudgingly tinkered with plumbing or heat or patched a roof. But he believed in saving his pennies for a rainy day. In Claymont's mind, it never rained quite hard enough to part with a cent. Still, his house on Oyster Shell Lane was a show please. Show place, as anyone in St. Chris could tell you, his wife Nancy could nag the ears off the turnip, and she ruled that roost. The wall-to-wall -wall carpet was thick and soft, the walls per prudently pampered, fussy curtains were ruthlessly coordinated with fuzzy upholstery. Magazines lay in military lines over a gleaming cherry wood coffee table that matched gleaming cherry wood end tables that matched gleaming cherry wood occasional tables nothing was out of place in the claremont house each room looked like a picture from a magazine like the picture cam used and not at all live life like <sighs> say so you're interesting in the barn with a stretched out grin that hid his teeth claymore ushered them all into his den it was decorated in english barbarial style the dark paneling was accented with hunting prints there were deep cushioned leather chairs and a port wide shade a desk with brass fittings and a brick fireplace covered converted to gas the big screen television seemed both out of place and typical mildly philip told him it had been agreed on the drive over that philip would handle the negotiation we're just starting looking around for a space terrific old place Claremont sat down behind his desk and gestured them the chairs. Lots of history, I'm sure, but we're not interested in history in this case. There seems to be a lot of rot. A bit. Claremont waved that away with one shorted finger hand. You live around here? What can you expect? You boys thinking of starting some business or rather? We're considering it. We're in the talk about its stages. Uh-huh. Claymore didn't think so, or the three of them wouldn't be sitting on the other side of his desk, as he considered just how much rent he could pry out of them. For what he considered an irritating weight around his neck, he looked and said, Well, we'll talk about it then. Maybe the boy here wants to go outside. No, he doesn't. Came simply last one. We're all, we're all taking, we're all talking about it. If that's the way you want it. So Claymore thought that that's the way it was. He could hardly wait to tell Nancy. Why, he'd had a good close-up look at the kid now. And a half-blind idiot could see Ray Quinn in those eyes. St. Ray, he thought sure, sourly. Looked like the mighty had fallen. Yes, sir. And he was going to enjoy letting people know what was what. I'm looking... I'm looking for a five-year lease, he told Philip. Correctly judging who would be handling the business in. We're looking for one year at this point, with an option for seven. Of course, we'd expect certain repairs to be completed before we took occupancy. Repairs came out lean back and said, Ha, that place is sold as rock. Sold as, <laughs> and we required termite inspection and treatment. Regular maintenance would, of course, be our responsibility. Ain't no damn bugs in that place. Well then, Phil smiled easily. You'd only have to arrange for the inspection. What are you asking for in rent? Because he was annoyed, and because he'd always despised Ray Quinn, Claymore bumped up his finger. Two thousand a month. Two. Two. Before Cam could chug out his platinum pin and fill rose. No point in wasting your time, then. We appreciate you seeing us. Hold it. Hold it. Claymore chuckled, fought off the light tug of panic, and having a deal slip through his grasping fingers. Didn't say that wasn't negotiable. After all, I knew your daddy.
He gave that tight-lipped smile that was said, knew more than twenty-five years. Wouldn't feel right if I didn't give his boys a little break. Fine. Philip settled down again, resting, rubbing, rest, resisting, rubbing his hands together. He forgot all his objections to the overall plan and his delight in the art of the deal. Let's negotiate. What the hell have I done? Thirty minutes later, Philip sat in his jeep, methodically wrapping his hand, his head against the steering wheel. A damn good job, I'd say. Ethan patted him on the shoulder. He reached the jeep ahead of camp. This time it had taken Winter's point in the front seat. Cut his opening price in half. Got him to agree to paying for most of the repairs if we do them ourselves. And confused him enough to have him go for the, what was it? Rent controlled clause. If we take the seven year option, the place is a dump. We're going to pay $12,000 a year. Not including utilities and maintenance. For pit. Yeah, but now it's our pit. Please can't stretch out his leg or try to pull that seat up, Ethan. I'm jammed back here. Nope. Maybe you should drop me back by the place. I can start figuring things, and I can get a lift home later. We're going shopping. Can't remind him. I don't need any damn shoes. Seth said again with a relax rather than annoyance. And reflex better than annoyance. You're getting damn shoes. And you're getting a damn haircut while we're at it. And we're all going to the damn mall. <laughs> I'd rather get hit with a brick than go to the... I'd rather get hit with a brick than go to the mall on a Saturday. He's hunched down on the seat. Pulled the brim of his cap low over his eyes. Couldn't bear to think about it. <laughs> when you start working in that death trap, Bill told him, you'll likely be hit with a ton of them. If I have to get a haircut, everybody's getting one. King Lance Blifford that sat mute in his face. You think this is a democracy? Shit. Grab some reality, kid. You're ten. <laughs> you could use one. Philip met Kim's eyes in the river mirror as he drove north out of St. Chris. Your hair's longer than his. Shut up, Phil. Ethan, goddammit. Pull your seat up. I hate the mall. In the pious, Ethan stretched his own legs out and tipped the back of his seat back a notch. It's full of people. Pete the barber still got his place on Market Street. Yeah, and everybody who walks out of there looks like Beaver Cleaver. Frustrated camp gave the back of the seat a seated solid kick. Keep your feet off my upholstery, Philip, or you walk to the damn mall. Tell him to give me some room. If I have to get shoes, I get to pick them out. You don't have any say in it. If I'm paying for the shoes, you'll wear what I tell you and like it. I'll buy the stinking shoes myself. I've got $20. Cam sort of ally. Try to get a grip on that reality again, kid. You can't buy decent socks for twenty dollars twenty these days. You can if you don't have to have some fancy designer label on them. He's tossing. This isn't Paris. You haven't bought decent socks shoes in ten years, came to back. And if you don't pull up that freaking sit, I'm gonna cut it out. Cut it out right now. Or I swear I'm gonna pull over and knock your heads together. Oh, my God. He took one hand off the wheel, dragged it down his face. I sound like Mom. Forget it. Just forget it. Kill each other. I'll dump the bodies in the mall parking lot and drive to Mexico. I'll learn how to weave mats and sell them on the beach at Cosmo. It'll be quiet. It'll be peaceful. I'll change my name to Raul. And no one knows ever related to a bunch of wolves. So I scratched his belly and turned to camp. Does he always talk like that? Yeah, mostly. Sometimes he's going to be... Going to, to be Paris and live in a garret in Paris, but it's the same thing. Weird. Well, that's the only comment. He pulled a piece of bubble gum out of his pocket, unwrapped it, and popped it in his mouth. Get new shoes. We're starting into a venture. Would have stopped the shoes if Cam had noticed that the seat of Seth's jeans were nearly worn through. Not that he thought that was a big deal, he assured himself, but it was probably best since they were there anyway. Pick up a couple pair of jeans. He had no doubt. That if Seth that bitch so much about trying on jeans, he himself wouldn't have felt compelled to push on the shirts, the shorts, to a windbreaker, and somehow they ended up with three baseball caps, an Oreo sweatshirt, and a glow-in-the-dark frisbee. <laughs> when he tried to think back to exactly where he'd taken the first wrong turn, it all became a blur of clothes, racks, complaining voices, and cash registers churning. The dogs greeted them 
With wild and desperate enthusiasm, the minute they pulled another dive, this would have been enduring, but for the fact that the pair of them reeked of dead fish. With much cursing and shoveling and threats, the humans escaped into the house, shutting the door dogs with their hurt feelings outside. The phone was ringing. Somebody get that. Kimberly says, take this junk upstairs, then go get those stinking dogs a bath. Both of them? The thought thrilled him, but he thought it best to complain. How come I have to do it? Because I said so. Oh, he hated falling back on something that lame. And that don't. The hose was round back. God, I want a bear. But because he lacked the energy, even for that, he dropped into the closest chair and stared glassy-eyed at nothing. If he had to face that mall again in this life, he promised himself he would just shoot himself in the head and be done with it. That was Anna. Philip told him as he wandered back into the Anna, Saturday night. He could stop the groan. I need a transfusion. She said to tell you she'd take care of dinner. Good, fine. I've got to pull myself together. The kid's yours and Ethan's tonight. <laughs> He's Ethan's, Phil Crip. I've got to date myself. But he sank into a chair and closed eyes. It's not even five o'clock. No, all I want to do is crawl into bed in oblivion. How do people do this? He's got enough clothes to last him a year. If we only had to do it once a year, how bad can it be? Phil opened one eye. He's got spring and summer clothes. What happens when fall gets here? Sweaters, coats, boots, and he's bound to outgrown every damn thing we bought today. We can't allow that to happen. There must be a pill or something we can give him. Or maybe he's got a coat already. He came pretty much with the clothes on his back. Dad didn't get a package deal this time either. Okay, we'll think about that later. Lots later. Can't press his fingers into his eyes. You saw the way Claymont looked at him. Then you. The nasty little glim in his beady little eyes. I saw it. He'll talk. And he'll say what he wants to say. Nothing we can do about it. You think the kid knows anything? One way or the other? I don't know what Seth knows. I can't get a handle on him. But I'm getting to look into investigators on Monday. Check on check on tracking down the mother. Asking for trouble. Or already got trouble. The only way to deal with it is to gather information. <coughs> if it turns out that Seth's a queen by blood, then we deal with that. Dad wouldn't have hurt Mom that way. Marriage wasn't just a thing to them. It was the thing. And they were solid. If he slipped, he'd have told her. That Philip firmly believed. And they'd have worked it out. The part of their lives wasn't our business. And it wouldn't be our business now. But for Seth. He wouldn't have slipped. Cam Mummer determined to believe it. I'll tell you one thing I got from them. You get married, you make that promise, that's it. Figured that's why the three of us are still on the single side of life. Maybe we can't ignore the talk, the suspicions. If the insurance company balks on paying off Dad's policy, it's going to put all four of us in a bind, especially since we just signed a lease for that hellhole. We'll be okay. Like starting to move in our direction. Oh, Bill asked his cameras. How do you figure that? Because I'm about to spend the evening with one of the sexiest women on the planet. And I intend to get very lucky. He glanced back as he stared upstairs. Don't wait up, bro. When he stepped into his bedroom, Cam heard the commotion from the backyard. He walked to the window and looked down on Seth, the doors, and the dogs. Simon was sitting stokely while Seth soaped them down. Bulls raced in mad circles, barking in excitement and terror at the hose that was pouring out water where it had been carelessly tossed on the grass. Of course, the kid was wearing his brand new shoes, which were now soaked wet and muddy. He was laughing like a loon. He hadn't known the boy could laugh like that. Cam realized as he kept watching, he hadn't known he could look like that. Unreservedly happy, young and silly. Simon stood up, gave a long, violent shake, sent water and soap flying. Backing up, Seth slipped in the water gra wet grass and tumbled on his back. He continued to howl with laughter as both dogs pounced on him. They wrestled over the water in mud and soap until the three of them were soaked and filthy. Upstairs Cam just stood watching with a mild, wild grin on his face. The image popped in his head when he headed down the hallway to Anna's apartment. He wanted to be able to tell her about it over dinner. He wanted to share it, and he thought it would certainly soften her every bit as much as a quiet meal in a candlelight restaurant. The roses he'd picked up on the way weren't going to hurt either. He sniffed them himself. If he was any judge of the female mind and heart, he'd bet his full stake that Anna Spinelli had a weak spot for yellow roses. Before he could knock on Anna's door, 
The door across the hall swung him. Hello there. You must be the new boyfriend. Ah, uh, Mrs. Ottoman. We met a few days ago. No, we didn't. You met my sister. Oh. He smiled cautiously. She looked exactly like the woman who had popped out the door before. He went out of the pink chalene roll. Well, how's it going? You brought her flowers. She'd like that. My beaux used to bring me flowers. And my Henry, God rest his soul, brought me lilacs every May. You think lilacs next month, young man, if Anna lets you keep around now. Keep coming around. Most of them, she escaped so long, but maybe she'll keep you. Yeah, he made her smile even as his heart stopped at words. Keep you? Maybe. On impulse, he pulled out one of the roses out and gave it to her with a neat little flourish. Oh, a girlish blush, pink on her wrinkled nose. Oh, my goodness. Her eyes gleamed with pleasure as she stood there. How lovely. How sweet. Why, if I were forty years younger, I'd fight Anna for you. She went flirtatiously, and I'd win. No contest. Flash the return wing grin. Ah, uh, say hi to your sister. You have a nice time tonight. You go dancing. She added as she shut the door. Good idea. And chuckled to himself. Cam knocked. When she answered, looking sexy enough to gobble up in three quick bites, he decided the dance should begin immediately. He snatched it up and whirled around to the throbbing elemental beat of classical Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. Then he dipped her as she laughed in some... Well, hello. <laughs> Enjoying the quick dizziness, she chuckled. Let me get up. You got me off balance. That's just where I want you. Off balance. He lowered his mouth to hers in a molten kiss that melted every bone in her body. With her head spinning, she clutched at his shoulders. Door still open. She managed to flail it out with her hand to slam it shut. Good thinking. He brought her up slowly, inch by inch, his mouth still nibbling busily on hers. Your neighbor said I should take you dancing. Oh, she was surprised. Seemed steam wasn't pumping out of her pores. Is that what that was? That was just a sample. He got her bottom lip between his teeth, tugged, really. Want a tango, Anna? I think we better sit this one out. But she pressed the hand to her heart to hold it in place as she eased out of her You brought me flowers. You burned her face in them as she took them from him. Figured I was a sucker for rosebuds, did you? Yeah. You're right. She laughed out for the blossoms. I'll put them in water. You can pour some wine. I've got it breathing on the counter. Glasses are right there. Okay. I. He looked over, saw a shiny pot steaming on the stove. A platter made of pasta on the counter. What's all this? Dinner. She crouched down at a kitchen cupboard to look at his face. Didn't Philip give you my message? I thought when you told him you'd take care of it, you meant you had some place you wanted to go, and you'll make the reservations. He plucked the stuffed mushroom off the platter, sampled it, sighed in pure sensual delay. I didn't think you'd be cooking for me. I like to cook, she said easily. She filled a pale pink vase with water, filled a pale pink vase with water. And I wanted to be alone with you. He smiled quickly. Hard to argue with that. What do we have? Linguini, with a famous Spinelli family red sauce. <laughs> she turned to take the glass of Merlot he'd poured for her. Her face was just a little flushed from the kitchen heat. The dress she'd chosen was the color of ripe peaches and molded to curves like a lover's hands. Her hair was down and curly maddenly, and her lips were painted nearly the same color as the wine she sipped. Cam decided if they were to have more than a three-second conversation before he grabbed her again, he better stay on the opposite side of the counter. It smells incredible. It tastes better. Her pulse was hammering everywhere at once. The way he looked at her, just that one long, intense, and measuring stare before he smiled, had brought out her need, a long and nagging ache of need, throbbing in insistently on an impulse to reach back and turn the flame under the pot off. Keeping her eyes on Cam, she walked around the camera counter. So do I, she told him. She set her glass aside, then took his, placed it on the counter, she shook her hair back, tipped her face up to his, smiled slowly. Try me. End of chapter 11.